Simple Questions. Why do paper cuts hurt so much? It doesn't matter if you're a small fry or the big guy. Just about everybody agrees that paper cuts really hurt. And there's three main reasons for that. The first reason is because you usually get them right on your fingertip. That's right, a paper cut on your knee or elbow wouldn't hurt quite as much. And why is that? Because your fingertips are super sensitive. They're the number one way your brain processes your sense of touch. That means there's tons and tons of nerves in your fingertips called nociceptors. Your fingertip is also a problem because you still need to use it all the time. That means your fresh new cut will bend and move as you use your finger, which adds to the pain and makes it take longer to heal. Now the placement of a paper cut is part of the story, but it's not the whole answer. The paper itself is also part of the problem. Unlike a knife, the edge of a piece of paper is dull and bendy. It's kind of like cutting meat with a dull knife. Instead of cutting cleanly, it pulls and tears at the meat. So when you get a paper cut, your finger is like a mini slab of meat being cut with a dull, papery knife. And it does lots of tiny damage that you can't quite see, but you can definitely feel. The final reason it hurts so much is because paper cuts are usually shallow and don't bleed. Without blood, the nerves stay exposed to the air and other irritants, which makes the pain much stronger and last longer. Why do we get headaches? Whenever you get a headache, it might feel like your brain is about to bust, but it isn't your brain that's feeling any pain. The throbbing sensation you feel actually comes from the nerves, blood vessels, and muscles in your neck and head. Anytime those blood vessels or muscles swell up or scrunch tight, they squeeze your nerves, which send messages to your brain basically saying, ow, I'm being squished. Those messages coming from your nerves are what we call a headache. The three most common types of headaches are tension headaches, cluster headaches, and migraines. Tension headaches are the most common, and they sort of feel like there's a tight band around your head. Experts still don't know what causes them, but the leading culprit seems to be tightening muscles in your face, neck, and head. Cluster headaches are much less common and much more painful. They're called clusters because the pain usually comes on in strong waves rather than lasting all day. They can wake you up in the middle of the night with watery eyes, a runny nose, and super intense pain around one eye or one side of your head. Not fun stuff. Another common and painful type of headache is the migraine. These are pulsing, throbbing, extra painful headaches that can leave you sensitive to light and sound and can even cause you to throw up. Ugh. And the worst part? Migraines can be genetic, which means it can run in your family and there's not much you can do about that. Headaches can be caused by all sorts of different things. Eating unhealthy food, staying up too late, getting too much sun or heat, too much screen time, extra strong smells, or the most common cause, stress. Okay, so that's what causes headaches and why we get them, but how can we prevent them? Well, try to see if any of the causes we mentioned could be the reaction. If you've only been eating junk food and your head hurts, have a healthy snack. If you didn't sleep well last night and you have a headache, try taking a nap. And if you just feel too stressed all the time, make sure you take time to relax. It's for your health. Why do we dream? When you go to sleep, it might feel like your mind and body are shutting down for the night, but actually, your brain keeps working while you sleep. That's right. While the rest of your body is resting and recovering, your brain is hard at work releasing all kinds of chemicals and hormones into the body that help you grow. These stages of brain activity are known as the sleep cycle. There's five stages to the sleep cycle, and you go through five or six cycles in a good night's sleep. Most dreaming happens during the stage where you're most asleep, called the rapid eye movement stage. During REM, or REM sleep, our eyes dart back and forth super fast behind our closed eyelids. But that's how and when we dream, but the big question remains, why do we dream? Well, humans have tried to answer this question for thousands and thousands of years. And even through the Atomic Age, Space Age, Information Age, and Age of Aquarius, we still can't say for sure why we dream. Experts do have a few theories, though. 
Some believe that dreams are the brain's way of processing all the emotions and experiences we had that day. Others believe dreams are a form of subconscious problem solving, where our brains tackle the big questions and problems we're dealing with in our lives. Some researchers think that dreams are nothing more than a bodily function, no more profound than a fart. So, why do we dream? Well, we don't know. But what we do know is that we spend about one third of our lives asleep. So, when you lay your head down tonight, just be glad you've got something fun to watch while you're sleeping a third of your life away. Why do we sleepwalk? If you've ever encountered a sleepwalker, you know how freaky it can be. Someone stumbling around like the walking dead, but eyes wide open, acting like they're wide awake. A sleepwalker might move around for as little as 30 seconds or as long as 30 minutes. And even though they might be walking, talking, and looking around, most sleepwalkers have no memory of their drowsy adventures the next morning when they wake up. Sleep experts aren't exactly sure why we sleepwalk, but they do know that it can run in your family and be passed down to you by your parents. Lack of sleep, fever, stress, excessive tiredness, and even some medications are other possible triggers that can cause you to sleepwalk. Most of the time, sleepwalking isn't very dangerous, but lots of sleepwalkers still get injuries big and small by bumping into things or falling over while sleepwalking. Most kids eventually grow out of sleepwalking. 15% of kids might sleepwalk, but only 4% of adults still stumble around in their sleep. If you ever encounter a sleepwalker, you shouldn't try to wake them. Rousing them from sleep, especially if you shake them too hard, is likely to leave them confused and distressed when they suddenly wake up. Someone that disoriented might accidentally fall, flee, or attack, and that's no good for anyone. Instead, your best move is to keep your cool and gently guide them back towards their bed so they can tuck themselves back in. So, why do we sleepwalk? Who knows? Sleep is maybe the most crucial part of human growth and health, but we still know so little about what our brains are doing while we sleep. So, until experts figure it out, let's just all agree to help steer sleepwalkers back to their beds. How do viruses work? Viruses are really small, about 100 times smaller than a single cell of bacteria. In fact, they're so small that the average microscope doesn't even pick them up. These vicious little packets of bad DNA can't reproduce on their own. Viruses need to attach themselves to a healthy cell in order to stay alive and replicate. They use a special receptor that works a bit like a key to a door, allowing the virus to attach itself to the cell, like a spaceship connecting to an airlock. Once the virus is in the cell, it starts duplicating itself over and over again until the healthy cell is overwhelmed, destroyed, and eventually dies. The virus keeps moving finding the nearest cell it can and attaches to it, starting the whole destructive process over again. Eventually, so many cells start to be destroyed that you start to get sick. Oftentimes, the fever, runny nose, sweats, or chills you get when sick is actually just signs that your body is currently killing off the virus. So, while it's never good to have a runny nose, at least next time, you'll know it means your body is trying to get you healthy. A virus transfers from person to person a few different ways depending on the virus. Some are passed by touch, some by tiny droplets in the air from the cough or sneeze of an infected person, and some viruses are passed on by infected insects. Throughout history, viral diseases like measles, mumps, tetanus, smallpox, and many others were a very real, common, and deadly part of everyday life. Luckily, through years of research, technology, and lots of hard work, scientists developed vaccines for most of the deadliest viruses in history. So, what's a virus? A pesky pile of damaged DNA that destroys everything it touches. So while no one likes getting a shot, if there is one available, try to remember what's at stake for your body. Why do we forget things? Memories are little snapshots or mental records of experiences from the past. 
all of your memories begin with your five senses. Taste, touch, smell, sound, and sight. Everything that you experience in life is through one of those five senses. Your brain is always choosing what info to save and what info to lose as you experience every moment of the day. If you tried to remember every single thing that you ever tasted, touched, smelled, heard, or saw, you'd overload your brain and fry it like an egg. Whatever information your brain decides is most important will be remembered, and that helps shape your memories. Now that your brain has made some choices about which info to keep and which to ditch, it's time to store that info, and your brain has to make another choice. How important is that info? Our brains only have so much space to remember things. Experts believe that humans can only keep about seven things in their memory for 30 seconds or so before it starts to slip away. That way, you can remember something like directions or a phone number in the short term. That's why you might have to repeat a new name or phone number to yourself a few times so you don't forget it. More important info, like the name of a friend or a family member's phone number, eventually makes their way from the short-term part of your memory to the long-term. That's why you might remember all the lyrics to a song you haven't heard in years. All those repeated listenings told your brain to store it away in the long-term part of your brain. Our brains can hold way more long-term memories than short-term. There seems to be no limit to the number of memories that this part of your brain can remember. That all just depends on how good of a memory you have. Why do we shiver when it's cold? Whenever we get cold, our teeth start to chatter and our bodies start to shake uncontrollably in order to keep us warm. You see, the inside of our bodies needs to stay at a certain temperature in order to work right. When it's cold out, our temperature drops and our bodies spring into action to keep us warm and toasty inside. The normal temperature for a human is around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So anytime the air is colder than that, we're technically losing heat. When it's cold enough to make us shiver, we're losing so much heat that our body reacts to automatically keep itself warm. Okay, so that's why we shiver, but why the shaking and chattering? How does that warm us up? Well, when you shiver, it might feel like you're just shaking in your boots, but actually, your muscles are tightening and relaxing over and over and over again super fast. All that muscle movement gives off heat, which warms you back up, at least enough to keep you healthy. Usually, when your muscles move and produce heat, it's an inconvenient byproduct and actually leads to sweating as a way to cool you down. But when you're cold, that energy from muscle movement is finally put to good use. So why do you shiver? Because your body is really good at taking care of itself, even when you don't. Why do our bones crack sometimes? Our bodies are full of all kinds of different joints in all shapes and sizes, each helping your skeleton make all kinds of movements. Hinge joints swing back and forth like, well, a hinge on a door. Elbows and knees are good examples of this. Ball and socket joints, like the shoulder and hip, can rotate around and swing. Gliding joints are usually small and always flexible so that bones can slip and slide against each other. You'll find them in your wrists, ankles, spine, and shoulder blades. Others, like the pivot, condyloid, and saddle joints, help you have movements in your neck, jaw, and fingers. Okay, so that's all the different kinds of joints we have in our bodies, but why do they make that snapping sound sometimes? Well, it turns out that the creepy cracking we hear is simply the sound of tiny little air bubbles full of gas escaping the fluid between our joints and popping. You see, a joint is just the spot where two bones meet. If those bones were always rubbing, scraping, and spinning against each other, they would wear out pretty quickly as we age. So, our bodies naturally cover our joints in specula fluids that keep the bones connected without grinding together. That fluid doesn't just keep your bones at a safe distance, it's also chock full of good nutrients to keep the joint healthy. Whenever you use one of your joints, the fluid bends and stretches, causing little gas bubbles to form inside the liquid. When they finally pop, it makes that loud noise we know. That's why some people can crack their knuckles or other joints on command. 
All it takes is popping those bubbles to make the noise. That's also why people can't pop the same spot over and over all day long. The joint needs to refill with new gas bubbles before it can crack again. So, is cracking your joints dangerous? Nope. Experts say it's perfectly okay to pop your joints from time to time. So, feel free to get cracking. Thank <laughs> you.